Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West. Episode 33, The Next Generation, Season 2. We finally ended our run of supplementals, and today we're going to catch up with the next generation of the House of Valois Burgundy. The last time we did this, we focused on John the Fearless and his brothers Anthony and Philip, as well as their brother-in-law, William of Bavaria. But now these princes are all dead, so we're going to explore the early lives and careers of their children. We've already gotten to know Philip, Count of Charolais, who I'll be referring to as Philip the Good from here on out, but I think it's still worth briefly going over his life before 1419. Philip was born in 1396 to John the Fearless and his wife, Margaret of Bavaria, the sister of William of Bavaria. Shortly after his father became the Duke of Burgundy, Philip was made the Count of Charolais and was married to Michelle of France, a daughter of King Charles VI. In 1411, Philip the Good was made his father's lieutenant in Flanders. He was only 15 at the time, so initially, he was mostly there to maintain a Burgundian presence in the Low Countries, while John the Fearless was busy in France. But Philip did take on real responsibilities fairly quickly, and the Count of Charolais would spend most of the rest of his father's life based in Ghent, leading the Commodal Council. This made him intimately familiar with the Low Countries in general, and Flanders in particular, upon becoming the Duke of Burgundy and Philip's time as duke will see the center of the Burgundian project shift to the Low Countries. Philip the Good did face opposition from the ever-turbulent Flemish towns, and on a few occasions had to deal with outright insubordination or revolt. But his steady hand meant that John the Fearless's later reign was marked by a period of relative harmony between the Count and County of Flanders. And as we're going to be spending a lot of time with Philip, let's explore his personality a bit. Philip was a far less serious and severe man than his father was, and who is also less vindictive. That being said, he shared the boundless ambition that marked the careers of his father and grandfather. And that ambition will lead to Philip seizing opportunities with ruthless abandon. If John the Fearless and Philip the Bold were both obsessives who needed their hands in all aspects of the Burgundian project, Philip the Good preferred to spend his time focusing on the finer things, such as hunting, court events, luxurious clothing, and women. However, he was no layabout. He had a keen political mind on his shoulders and was a capable diplomat. But much of the minutia of government was handed off to subordinates. Very capable subordinates who we will get to know over the coming episodes. And it is to Philip's credit that he was both good at delegating and good at finding talented people to delegate things to. But of course, Philip only represented one part of the House of Valois Burgundy. So we also need to see what's been going on in Brabant and Nevers since the deaths of Anthony and Philip at Agincourt, and look at the battle between John the Pitiless and his niece Jacqueline of Bavaria for the counties of Hainaut, Holland, and Zeeland. Let's start off with Brabant. Anthony of Burgundy had married Joan of Saint-Paul back in 1402, and the couple had two children together. John, who I'll be referring to as John the Fourth of Brabant, and Philip of saint Paul. Joan died in 1407, and Anthony later married Elizabeth of Gorlitz, the Duchess of Luxembourg. This briefly made Anthony the Duke of Luxembourg, but by the time he died, the couple had no surviving children, so Luxembourg left the Burgundian domains, at least for the time being. When Anthony died, there was also the risk that Brabant would leave the Burgundian domains. The king of Germany at the time, Sigismund of Luxembourg, was quite hostile to the Burgundian presence in his empire, and so refused to recognize John IV as the new Duke of Brabant. In fact, he had also refused to recognize Anthony as Duke of Brabant, but that didn't mean too much, as Anthony was well established in Brabant by the time Sigismund came to the throne. However, In the uncertainty after Anthony's death, Sigismund's attempts to designate Brabant as a vacant imperial fief could have been successful with support in Brabant itself. But the king of Germany's machinations were stopped by the estates of Brabant. As we saw throughout Philip the Bold's many attempts to secure Brabant for himself, the estates of the duchy 
were keen to preserve Brabant's independence, and that included independence from the Imperial House of Luxembourg. Therefore, upon hearing the news of Anthony's death, the estates gathered to recognize John IV as the new duke and install a regency council, as John was only twelve at the time. Upon hearing this, Sigismund was reported to have asked representatives of the estates of Brabant, so you want to be French? From Sigismund's point of view, there were two paths forward for Brabant. Reintegration into the empire, preferably under the direction of the House of Luxembourg, or Franco-Burgundian domination. But the estates saw a middle path, where their independence would be assured by a local, albeit Burgundian, dynasty. Back in episode 30, when talking about the deaths of Anthony of Burgundy and William of Bavaria, I wrote that, Vultures were swirling above, hoping to snatch land and power from their heirs. And I feel the need to note that John the Fearless was certainly one of those vultures. We all know how John the Fearless loved to dominate a regency council, so he immediately sent a message to the estates of Brabant, attempting to secure his rights to guardianship over his nephews, John of Brabant and Philip of saint -Pol. However, the estates were just as keen to preserve their independence from the Duke of Burgundy as they were from the King of Germany, and responded firmly that the regency would remain in Brabant. John the Fearless was never one to give up on an opportunity to expand his power, and so made a personal visit to Brabant a few months later to continue his campaign for power in the duchy and again a few months after that. All the while, Burgundian agents were in constant contact with the towns and estates of the duchy, trying to woo them to the Burgundian side. John the Fearless continued Philip the Bold's old practice of paying fief rents to many important nobles and ducal officials in Brabant, so a sizable portion of the ruling class in Brabant did have ties to the Duke of Burgundy. But all of his attempts came to naught, as the estates of Brabant simply had no interest in allowing John the Fearless to gain control of the regency, and even many of the pro-Burgundian partisans still valued the independence of Brabant. The estates saw a Burgundian regency as the first step towards Burgundian domination, and, to be fair, that's also how John the Fearless saw it. The regency council ended up being mainly made of representatives from the cities of Brabant, an indication of the increasing influence of those cities. But it did also include several nobles who had ties to the Burgundian party. The Burgundians tended to be counterbalanced by a pro-imperial faction, but factionalism in Brabant didn't come anywhere close to the factionalism, say, in Holland. More on that shortly. Therefore, while John the Fearless's power over the council was limited, he still had some influence over the Duchy of Brabant, and a good deal of influence over his nephews personally. Even after John IV reaches the age of majority, the estates of Brabant will maintain significant power in the duchy. John IV was not the most strong-minded member of the House of Burgundy, and several books I've read refer to him as ineffectual, which I honestly find quite fitting. On a few occasions, the estates will take the reins from the duke, and, at one point, they will install his brother as regent to defend the interests of Brabant when John fails to do so. While John IV was busy ruling Brabant, or, more accurately, busy being in Brabant while the Regency Council did much of the actual ruling, his younger brother Philip, who had inherited the county of Saint-Paul in Artois, was a part of the Burgundian court. We don't know too much about Philip's early career, apart from the fact that he was present at many of the important events during John the Fearless's later reign, such as his negotiations with the Armagnacs, his negotiations with the English, his negotiations with the Dauphinists, and his negotiations with the English. At some point after the Burgundian seizure of Paris in 1418, John the Fearless made Philip of Saint-Paul his lieutenant in the capital. Saint-Paul was only 15 at the time, and was left with the difficult job of holding the capital for the Duke of Burgundy, while the English were in the midst of their advance. Despite the center of the Burgundian-aligned royal government moving to Troyes, many important governmental institutions remained in the French capital, and the symbolic importance of Paris remained as well. Saint-Paul, thus, was meant to keep an eye on those institutions, and act as the Burgundian at home, for lack of a better term. 
Saint-Paul would serve as the Burgundian captain of Paris until the end of 1420, and while he did leave the city on occasion to deal with affairs in his own territories in Brabant or at the Burgundian court, his time in the city was instrumental to maintaining the Burgundian presence in Paris. His job in Paris was unenviable and difficult. Many of the pressures on the capital didn't let up when the Burgundians captured the city. Food was still expensive, the populace was still restless, and the English were still stone's throw away. The one major difference was that now hostile Dauphinist garrisons were disrupting the city's supply lines, rather than hostile Burgundian garrisons. All of this being said, the goodwill that John the Fearless had in Paris didn't evaporate immediately, so Philip never had to resort to the same kinds of oppressive tactics that the Count of Armagnac did. When John the Fearless was murdered on the bridge of Montereau, Philip of Saint-Paul was able to use the people's outrage to reaffirm their commitment to the Burgundian cause, and, in fact, their shared indignation did much to smooth over the tense relationship between the populace and the Burgundian leaders of the city. The people of Paris agreed to renew their oaths of loyalty to Saint-Paul, and swore to support his defense of the city against both the English and the Dauphinists. They also swore to never give support to the murderers of John the Fearless, something which will certainly cause the Dauphin some trouble. There's not much more that I can say about the Count of Saint-Paul at this point, but there is much less to say about his cousins, Charles and John, the sons of Philip of Nevers. Admittedly, this is because Charles was one and John was even younger at the time of their father's death, so they really didn't get up to much. Their mother, Bonne of Artois, was the regent of Nevers and Rethel in the years after the Battle of Agincourt, and we will have cause to return to her in the future. Bonne was a granddaughter of John, Duke of Berry, and her marriage to Philip of Nevers was a part of an attempt to reconcile the Armagnacs and Burgundians between the fall of the Cabo Chien and the Armagnac offensive into Artois. Despite her familial ties to the Armagnacs and the brevity of her marriage to Philip of Nevers, Bonne remained loyal to the House of Burgundy, and the counties of Nevers and Rethel remained firmly in the Burgundian orbit during her lifetime. We now come to Jacqueline of Bavaria, the only legitimate child of William, Count of Haino, Holland, and Zealand. Jacqueline was born in 1401, and the first event of note in her life was when she was betrothed to John of Terrain, a son of Charles VI, as a part of Philip the Bold and John the Fearless's plan to intertwine the House of Burgundy with the royal house. John of Terrain and Jacqueline were brought up together in Haino, with the expectation that they would one day rule the three Wittelsbach Low Country counties. Things changed in 1415, when John became the Dauphin, but Jacqueline's world was truly turned upside down in 1417, when John of Terrain and then William of Bavaria died in quick succession. Now Jacqueline was single again, and also the Countess of Haino, Holland, and Zealand. Jacqueline was readily accepted in Haino, as the county wasn't filled with the same kind of partisan division that Holland was, and furthermore, had a much more established tradition of female succession than its northern counterpart. But the situation in Holland was more complex, and there were many who disputed Jacqueline's right to succeed her father. The most prominent of these was her uncle, John the Pitiless, the Bishop of Liège. As Jacqueline was touring through Hainaut, making joyous entries into the major towns and accepting homage from the local nobility, the House of Arkel, which had opposed William of Bavaria in Holland, once more went into revolt. This reignited the long struggle between the Hook and Cod factions, and Jacqueline's uncle, John the Pitiless, saw the chaos in Holland as an opportunity to claim power in the county. He came up from Liège and allied himself with the Cods and the House of Arkel, and in the name of restoring order, he claimed the role of Guardian of Holland. John the Pitiless established himself in the city of Dordrecht, and not long after, Jacqueline led a small army against her uncle. The Countess was victorious in their first confrontation, but she did not have the means to dislodge him from Dordrecht. Unfortunately for Jacqueline, John the Pitiless was not alone in his opposition to his niece. As I mentioned in the last supplemental episode, William of Bavaria was a partisan of the Hook faction in Holland, so the rival faction, the Cods, 
saw an opportunity to regain their influence by opposing his daughter. The king of Germany, Sigismund of Luxembourg, also opposed Jacqueline's right to inherit Haino, Holland, and Zealand. He had held this position for a while, as a few years earlier, when William was meeting with Sigismund, the subject of succession to the Wittelsbach counties was brought up. After William of Bavaria insisted that the king of Germany recognize his daughter as his heir, Sigismund replied by bringing up his brother John the Pitiless and his many cousins. Sigismund's opposition was not only a matter of misogyny, although there was certainly an element of that present. As we have seen, the king of Germany opposed French expansion into the Holy Roman Empire generally, and Burgundian expansion in particular. And, as a niece of John the Fearless, Jacqueline was seen to be just as Burgundian as she was Bavarian. So not long after William of Bavaria died, Sigismund used his imperial prerogative to invest John the Pitiless with the counties of Haino, Holland, and Zealand. And to further cement their alliance, John the Pitiless renounced his bishopric and married Sigismund's niece, Elizabeth of Gorlitz, Anthony of Burgundy's widow, and John IV of Brabant's former stepmother. He was able to do this with relative ease, as he had never actually taken holy orders, and so for the past 29 years, he had technically been the bishop-elect of Liège, rather than the bishop. I bring up Elizabeth's relationship to John IV here, because John the Pitiless was not the only one to marry around this time. In order to consolidate the Burgundian party in opposition to John the Pitiless, John the Fearless arranged for Jacqueline and John IV to get married. I apologize for the amount of Johns in that sentence, but there's unfortunately not a great way to get around it, as Jacqueline's story simply has too many Johns in it. However, John the Fearless was pretty tied up with affairs in France at the time, so the details of this marriage were handled by his sister, Margaret of Burgundy, Jacqueline's mother, and his son, Philip the Good. There were several reasons for this match. First, it tied two of the branches of the House of Burgundy together, which represented a renewal of the 1405 alliance between John the Fearless, Anthony of Burgundy, and William of Bavaria, and it reinforced the Burgundian hold on Haino, Holland, and Zealand. Second, by combining the resources of Brabant and Haino, Holland, Zealand, it created a stronger bloc to oppose John the Pitiless and Sigismund of Luxembourg. And third, by marrying Jacqueline off to John IV, John the Fearless was able to prevent another prince from coming in and adding the Wittelsbach counties to his own house. Now you might recall that John IV and Jacqueline were first cousins, so let's ignore the eh of it all and focus on the fact that papal dispensation would be needed for the marriage to be considered legitimate. This was all happening during the Council of Constance, and Pope Martin V had just been elected to end the Western Schism. In his first years as Pope, Martin's position was still fairly uncertain, and he was conscious of the need to cultivate support from both the Council and the crowned heads of Western Christendom. Martin initially agreed to give his assent to the marriage, but a few weeks later, Sigismund pressured him to recant that assent. Regardless, the Burgundians decided to go along with the wedding anyway, and in early 1418, the cousins were wed in a ceremony with dubious legitimacy. Meanwhile, John the Pitiless did not accept his initial defeat as a sign to give up his ambitions in Holland. He doubled down on his alliance with the Cod faction and appealed to the cities. He promised to expand their privileges if they recognized him, and furthermore made his base in Holland while Jacqueline moved to Brabant. John the Pitiless also played on the city's fear of regional competition by claiming that the rising trading centers of Holland would play second fiddle in privileges and opportunities to the Brabantine towns of Antwerp, Mechelen, and Bergen. He made some progress, and in response, John IV of Brabant and his brother Philip of Saint-Paul each gathered an army and led them into Holland to kick out John the Pitiless once and for all. However, this campaign turned out to be a disaster, and in its aftermath, Jacqueline's supporters in Holland were demoralized, and John the Pitiless began an offensive of his own, which further cemented his position and expanded his reach. At this point, John the Fearless and Philip the Good decided that they needed to intervene in this conflict to negotiate a settlement. 
After all, the Burgundian position in the Low Countries couldn't risk being weakened. So, Philip went to Vodrichum, on the border of Brabant and Holland, to negotiate with Jacqueline and the Johns. The treaty ended up being very beneficial to John the Pitiless, and was in essence a slap in Jacqueline's face. John the Pitiless was allowed to keep the lands that he currently held in Holland. He was to be made joint regent for Holland for a period of five years, and he would be recognized as Jacqueline's heir if she had no children. Furthermore, as compensation for officially relinquishing his claim to be the Count of Holland, he would be paid a hundred thousand nobles by John IV and Jacqueline. The Countess refused to accept this deal, although her husband assented, and unfortunately for Jacqueline, that was enough. There's an argument to be had here about the Duke of Burgundy's true motivations in this battle over Holland, and the treaty that Philip negotiated did end up weakening Jacqueline's position significantly. Despite his initial support for Jacqueline, we will see that Philip the Good will turn on his cousin eventually. So, if he and his father had been secretly encouraging John the Pitiless from the get-go, there was always the chance that they could use the chaos in Holland to expand Burgundian influence. However, I personally find it unlikely that the Dukes of Burgundy gave any support to John the Pitiless before 1421, and the poor terms for Jacqueline can also be attributed to her husband's reluctance to fight for her. This was all done a few months before the death of John the Fearless, and after his assassination, Philip the Good's focus shifted from the Low Countries to France. With everything going on in France at the moment, which we will explore next episode, Philip simply wanted the peace between Jacqueline and John the Pitiless to last, and the tenuous truce that he helped negotiate be maintained. However, the volatile political situation in Holland would not be calmed simply because Philip didn't have time to deal with it. From here, Jacqueline's position began to deteriorate further, in large part thanks to her husband. Due to the political realities of the time, John IV was expected to rule Jacqueline's counties on her behalf, like how Philip the Bold ruled in Flanders. However, while Philip the Bold was an energetic and ambitious statesman, John IV of Brabant was lethargic and uninspired. While the marriage of Jacqueline of Bavaria and John of Brabant was a great move from a diplomatic and political point of view, on the ground level, it was a disaster. In part, this was a personality mismatch. As I've noted, John IV was unambitious and lazy, while Jacqueline was described by the Burgundian chronicler Georges Chastelain as, quote, extremely pretty, extremely lively, vigorous, and totally unsuited to a feeble husband. Jacqueline soon grew to loathe her husband, and John felt the same way. John IV didn't seem to mind snide comments and insults about his wife at court. In fact, he encouraged them. And the enmity between John and Jacqueline didn't end with gossip. He also began to avoid his wife, going so far as to leave town without letting her know on multiple occasions. As the struggle between Jacqueline and John the Pitiless continued, the Duke of Brabant began to resent the resources that it was consuming and saw his wife's patrimony as a liability rather than an asset. This in turn caused more friction between the couple. Meanwhile, John IV found himself surrounded by advisors with ties to the Cod faction in Holland, and by extension to John the Pitiless. Day by day, the husband began to desert the cause of his wife. Ruth Putnam, in her biography of Jacqueline of Bavaria, writes, quote, Had John of Brabant been in love with and ready to yield to his energetic and masterful young wife, all might have gone smoothly. He had to be dominated by somebody, and she was quite capable of taking the helm of her husband's one statelet as well as her own three. But he was probably bored from the beginning by her demands for his aid in her own realm was weary with her indignation at his failure to give such aid effectively, and sullen at her exasperation. Jacqueline was a passionate woman, and often raised her voice at her husband. But John's conduct towards Jacqueline can really only be described as abusive. In early 1420, John dismissed Jacqueline's entire household, her court ladies and her advisors. These Hollander and Haino men and women had been Jacqueline's most prominent supporters at court, and in many cases had known the Countess since she was a child. 
John isolated his wife and surrounded her with strangers and unfriendly faces from Brabant. Jacqueline's advisors and court ladies who stuck around did so voluntarily as their wages were now being paid to creatures of Duke John. Apparently unsatisfied with his attempts to isolate his wife, John IV began to slowly reduce the amount of food and supplies that were provided to Jacqueline's household until she was cut off completely. If any member of Jacqueline's court wanted to eat, they would have to provide for themselves, something made more difficult by their lack of salary, or attend meals hosted by John, which had a hostile atmosphere, to say the least. And this hostility was made evident at an Easter meal in 1420. While Jacqueline's Brabander attendants were served, her ladies and advisors from Haino and Holland were purposefully snubbed and only given empty plates. Around this time, John IV was also in talks with John the Pitiless. As the former was short on cash, and the latter was hungry for more power and legitimacy in Holland, an amendment to the earlier peace of Vaudrechem was arranged. John IV had been late in his payments to John the Pitiless, and really didn't want to keep making them. So in exchange for releasing John IV from about 80% of the indemnity owed him, and further agreeing to pay the Duke of Brabant 90,000 ecus, recognizing the legitimacy of John IV and Jacqueline's marriage, and giving up his claim to Haino, John the Pitiless was made the full regent of Holland and Zealand rather than joint regent with John IV, and furthermore, his period of regency was extended from 5 to 12 years. This deal was, of course, sealed without Jacqueline's approval, and represented the death knell of John and Jacqueline's marriage. There were still places in Holland loyal to Jacqueline, but after this deal was made, they were isolated and began to fall to John the Pitiless, one by one. John the Pitiless had now officially given up his claim to be Count of Holland, but as Ruvart, who was the Count in all but name, in essence, he had won. Shortly after Easter of 1420, Jacqueline and her mother abandoned Brabant for Haino, the one territory which was still loyal to her. And once in Haino, Jacqueline made plans to repudiate her marriage. Both Philip the Good and Jacqueline's mother, Margaret of Burgundy, had attempted to mediate during the couple's rough patches, i.e. most of their marriage. However, Philip was still quite distracted by other affairs and could not dedicate enough energy to his cousins while Margaret was dismissed by John IV as much as Jacqueline was. Jacqueline realized that her marriage was not working, and that John IV would not help her regain her territories, or even treat her with respect. Jacqueline's own reasons for ending the marriage to John IV were based on the fact that John IV had alienated her patrimony, isolated her in Brabant, and abused her. However, as this was the Middle Ages, these reasons weren't considered good enough by many men in power. So her advisors decided to focus on the fact that the marriage between John and Jacqueline was performed after the papal dispensation which had been initially granted was revoked. Complicating things was the fact that an additional dispensation was granted by the Pope a year into John and Jacqueline's marriage, but that was simply ignored. Jacqueline and her advisors considered the initial shady papal dispensation to be enough, and declared the marriage annulled. Once the declaration was made, notice was given to John IV of Brabant and to Philip the Good. John IV refused to accept this annulment, but he was currently dealing with other problems in Brabant. John's incompetence with respect to Jacqueline's counties had been noticed by the estates of Brabant and in the dispute between the Duke and Duchess, the estates ended up siding with Jacqueline. They had done more than John IV to try and protect Jacqueline's counties, and, like Jacqueline, resented their alienation. Shortly before Jacqueline fled Brabant, the estates called on Philip of Saint-Paul to come and serve as the Duchy's regent, as John IV had proven himself incapable of ruling in their eyes. And the loss of Holland wasn't the only reason for this, as John was incompetent in a variety of fields. For a while, a contest for the Duchy of Brabant began between the sons of Anthony of Burgundy. John IV tried to remove his brother from the regency by force of arms, but the people of Brussels refused to open the gates of the city to their duke unless he agreed to enter in peace. John ended up backing down. 
In Brussels, the brothers continued their power struggle on more peaceful terms, but not entirely peaceful. John IV's advisors conspired to keep the Duke away from his brother and the estates, and to reverse the regency. Eventually, Philip of Sampol and the estates of Brabant decided that enough was enough, and had many of these ministers arrested, and eventually executed. Before too long, it seemed that the regency of Philip of Sampol and the estates of Brabant would completely sideline the duke. In the end, John IV managed to recover his position, although only partially. For one, he was able to reconcile with his brother, which took the wind out of the sails of the opposition. From there, John managed to reach a compromise with the estates of Brabant and the city of Brussels in 1422, which restored them to obedience in exchange for a whole host of additional rights and privileges. This deal, known as the New Government, ceded much of John IV's power to the estates of Brabant, and effectively neutered the office of Duke. Nominally, it was an extension of previous agreements between the Dukes of Brabant and the estates, but in practice it went much further than any of those deals had. The estates were granted the power to appoint and dismiss members of John's ducal council, as well as many of John's other officers and judges. The estates were also given control over the duke's debts, law and order, and the power to ensure the territorial integrity of Brabant. Evidently, the ease at which John IV gave away Jacqueline's lands had not been forgotten. More rights were also granted to the cities. They were given the ability to choose their own magistrates, and the only input from the center would be from the estates. And, if John were to try and use foreign soldiers to impose ducal order on the towns, something which had happened during the power struggle of 1420, they had the right to resist his forces. The new government concerned Philip the Good for a few reasons. The traditional class conflict between the great lords and the estates was a factor, and Philip probably didn't want to see his cousin lose power. Philip the Good was able to dominate his cousin with relative ease, and while there was a large pro-Burgundian faction in the estates of Brabant, there was also a significant pro-imperial one. So Burgundian domination over a Brabant ruled by the estates was not a foregone conclusion. But even before the new government was arranged, John was noticeably in trouble, and the Duke of Burgundy decided that it was worth prying himself away from affairs in France in order to help his cousin. So to protect the Burgundian hold over Brabant and over Haino, Holland, and Zealand, Philip decided to visit Brussels in early 1421, hoping to reconcile John IV with his wife and brother. Jacqueline was called back to Brabant so that the cousins could get together and sort everything out but she saw that the conference would either reinforce John IV's control over her, or make Philip the Good her guardian in John's stead, an even more distasteful possibility. Either way, she saw little chance in the meeting resulting in her re-empowerment, or the recovery of her counties. Therefore, Jacqueline of Bavaria decided to take drastic measures. She did leave Haino soon after receiving Philip the Good's summons, but rather than heading for Brussels, the Countess made for Calais. Jacqueline of Bavaria had secretly been in contact with the English over the past few weeks, and decided that her fortunes were best served with the help of Henry V. From Calais, Jacqueline crossed the English Channel and made her way to London, where she was received by Henry V and his court. While in Brabant she had been subjected to snubs and insults, in England she was given a lavish welcome. The Countess of Haino, Holland, and Zealand had found a new protector, but in doing so, she lost any remaining goodwill from the Duke of Burgundy. But it will be a few weeks until we return to Jacqueline of Bavaria. So for now, we'll leave her in England. She's lost all control over her counties, but at least there she's being treated with respect. Next time, we're going to return to France and cover Philip the Good's first year as Duke of Burgundy as well as his own alliance with the English, as the fallout from John the Fearless's assassination changes the course of the Hundred Years' War. Thank you so much to my patrons. Christine, Duchesse de Namur. Peter, Duc de Brancion. Elliot, Graf von Kravenstein. Anthony, Comte de Chateauneuf-Nuxois. James, Graf von Temsa. 
Preston, Comte de Saint Fargo. Mark, Comte de Merceau. Diana, Kraft von Biersel. Mehmet, Comte Santer. Chris, Comte de Samour. David, Kraft von Bornem. Rosa, Comte de Germol. Elliot, Comte de Bussy le Grand. Quinton, Kraft von Blasfeld. Tyler, Comte de Chamaray. Ian, Kraft von Arenberg and to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Burgundy on Twitter or Blue Sky or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.